Nicholas, is it your first time uh, to Hong Kong? I think I've been to Hong Kong, I think, five times. Five times. I used to go a lot when I was much younger, when I had friends who worked for Jardine Maths <laughs> and had very, very good times on the peak. I also conceived my first child in the Macau suite at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. Wow. With great difficulty, it must be said, because this suite came complete with a, one of those personal butlers. And every time my wife and I were about to set to work on this important task, he would appear with ice. <laughs> and so we very nearly didn't. But I've had the, got this special connection. Is that on. incident in any one of your novels? Everything that I do in my life is in every one of my novels. You've written so many novels. I mean, people know you as a publisher. People uh, uh, live in awe uh, because you are the managing director of the great house of Condé Nest. But secretly, you are a novelist, uh, and I think you've written about seven novels. Isn't that right? Uh, it is. I've done, I think, 15 books, but seven of them were fiction. I but I'm a, li I'm a little yeah. bit of a... Uh, you have to have a secret second life, I think, in this world. I don't play golf, so I write on Saturday and Sunday mornings. And my system is to get up very early before the household is awake, and I write a thousand words on Saturday and a thousand words on Sunday. And you actually only have to do that for two years, and you've written a very, very thick novel. Like what I think, that if I ran three miles a day, after about 15 years, I go around the equator. It is the but exact that's a, Yeah, equivalent. but it's very long, yes. But um, do you find it soothing to write, or is it something that you've always wanted to do and that you were determined to do it, notwithstanding uh, your day job? Well, the truth is, I rather like having this parallel life where you have like a, a second thing going on in your head and where you're able to make up and control all the, cust uh, all the characters in your book. And uh, I think if, I sometimes wonder, would I like to have written full time? And of course, there is a slight temptation to do that. And I think I could probably have done that. But I like too much the excitement and overexcitement and stimulation of going into a magazine office where I'm surrounded by hundreds of fantastically attractive women. I know in Vogue House, uh, I've never seen so many beautiful uh, girls going in and out. Although in this age of uh, sexism, uh, one is not supposed to talk about it. Not only is one not supposed to touch, but one isn't supposed to even look. Oh, well, and I do well, sometimes well. consider myself lucky. I've got friends who went to work in the city, and they work in those big sweaty dealing rooms with 700 men, all vastly rich. I work in an office where there's about 20 men, mostly who work in the post room, <laughs> and then um, 680 women. Those. Um, but listen, um, of the other seven books that you've written other than your novels, what, 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 what are they on, mostly? I did two large non-fiction books, um, one called The Fashion Conspiracy, which is the only book I've ever written which had the distinction of being the number one bestseller for one week oh, well, in the good. Sunday Times. Yes. However, I kept the clipping, just to remind myself it happened. And I did a huge book called Paper Tigers, which actually was partly set in Hong Kong, where I interviewed all the newspaper owners of the world in the States, in Europe, in, in uh, Hong Kong, in India, etc., which was a considerable what was the What was the conclusion uh, in your book on fashion? What was this conspiracy? What is the conspiracy? The fashion book started in some of the sweatshops in Korea and in South India where they were doing the beading for very expensive clothes. And then it followed the progress of, of the way that the industry works and ended up going through all the rich people who buy them. And then ended up in this fantastic dry cleaners, which I found in Kuwait, which was full of the most amazing couture clothes that had cost tens of thousands of pounds each, and which the Arab princesses who'd bought them had worn them once, sent them to be cleaned, and never bothered to collect them. And that's where this long journey uh, ended. Well, there it is. But um, are you looking forward to uh, returning to Hong Kong? When was the last time you were there? I don't think I've been to Hong Kong for 10 years. Oh, and, uh, uh, I, you were there after the handover? Yeah, I've been, handover. I've, been, I've been since the handover. Yes. Um, one time, and I think I went about a year after. I'm dying to see it again. I'm hoping it hasn't changed too much, because I liked it like it was before. No, as well, is, is, is richer and more prosperous and more vulgar, I suppose. Um, but um, uh, the people of Hong Kong would, would, would love to hear uh, your view, I'm sure, not only on writing, 
but also in the way in which your magazines have uh, suddenly appeared, uh, the, the Chinese edition of Vogue, the Chinese edition of this and the Chinese edition of that. Uh, do you regard China as a huge market? Uh, and China for Condé Nast has become, in the last 10 years, an extremely important market. It's going to be, it's going to be one of the big markets for us, along with America and Italy and Britain. Uh, the appetite amongst this growing Chinese audience to buy fashion magazines and to take part in the growth of luxury fashion and luxury goods is phenomenal. Do you have a temptation to write a novel about this whole thing, uh, like a, uh, the parody of one of your colleagues, um, Miss Anna Winter in um, uh, The Devil of the where's Prada. Prada, or whatever it is called. I mean, would there be a, a Nicholas, uh, where's the Gucci, or what, what, whatever? Well, all my, <laughs> throughout my entire professional life, I've always flown very, very close to the wind. <laughs> but I'm not going to fly so close as to write a book with anyone too like Anna Winter in it. That, I think, would be too much of a suicide mission, even for me. I'm sure that somebody in the audience will ask you about her, and, uh, and ask you about lots of things about the fashion. But I hope that they will also have read, and I'm sure that there are many people who have read your novels, and that uh, they will ask you about your, your novels. So my final question is this, is that in your novel, is there an overriding theme, uh, and are you working on the latest one, which is slightly different or more or less the same of the same? Well, I like writing and have been writing big, multi-character sagas, usually over about 25 to 30 years. Um, I guess they're normally set in what you would call the high life, though not exclusively so. The new one that I'm writing about, the as-yet-untitled new novel, is like a modern-day version of um, Vanity Fair, the novel, and has a character rather like Becky Sharp, the prime yes. Becky Sharp, but a modern-day version. I just Pat named her as one of my fictional characters to want to have dinner with. Um, uh, the dead one, I said, um, uh, Emperor Chen Long and Bernard Russell, perhaps. But Becky Sharp, definitely. Yes. I feel we've both of us had yes, many dinners was, yes. with modern-day Becky she Sharp in our lifetime. She must have been incredibly lifetime. attractive. I think she was definitely attractive. And, n but n and so is Kath Fox, the fictional character in my new one, uh, who see. goes on an enormous journey. Is she ruthless? Is she a, 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 Five a, times a, a gold digger? Certainly is. She's uh, yes. married to a newspaper tycoon and later to a member of the royal family and to a footballer. She goes through a long, ever a cross section. Yes, well, there it is. But I, I must say, in, in, in Vanity Fair, I always felt slightly for Becky Sharp. I always had, I was always somehow on her side. I don't know why, but I mean, she was absolutely uh, ruthless. But there was a gentler side and a rather attractive side to her. Well, she's, very, she's very lovable. Well, and of course the other extraordinary thing about, the, about Vanity Fair is that the other main character is called George Osborne, the same, oh, well, as, our, same as our Chancellor of the Exchequer. So at well, any show, so everything goes round. And uh, does George Osborne appear as George Osborne as a character and in name in your new novel? Uh, George is not going to be appearing in my new novel, though of course there are characters immensely like him. Uh, Nicholas, thank you very much, and we we'll much look forward to seeing you in Hong Kong. Me too.